Good day, people of YouTubes. I got a SATA cable here. And I have a victim 2 terabyte hard drive. We're going to see if we can get this system down here on the floor to get it to spin up and give me the full 2 terabyte capacity. Not quite sure. So, what we have here is a MSI AMD custom build computer that a friend bought at the thrift store and we're gonna try and put Windows Server 2016 on this thing just trying out the 100 whoops sorry bumping the camera cuz charging cord uh, we're gonna try the 180 day evaluation I'm just gonna see if I can even get this thing to even work because uh, hell I got a 180 day evaluation license who really gives a crap um, I believe Microsoft actually emailed me the product key. I'm really not sure. I have to check my email. But anyway, um, so right now, while we're waiting for this to be made, because I'm using Rufus to write the ISO to a USB stick on ye olde iMac. And in fact, there's the USB stick right in the back. I'm really surprised at how well Windows 8 runs in a virtual machine on the iMac. It's actually really nice running. No lag, unless of course you tax the disk, which you can obviously bet it's doing right now. This is the largest ISO I've seen in quite a while. Six and a half gigabytes. Oops, sorry about the crap on the screen, but six and a half gigabytes. That's just insane. But then again, I can see the whole reason why that's so big is because it's a server operating system. There's a bunch of stuff going on. So what are you talking about, Windows Phone? Oh, it's just catching up on YouTube uploads. Whatever. So my attention is to see if I can get this old hard drive that came out of a DISH DVR to spin up because it still probably has some kind of DISH firmware on it and see if I can access the full two terabyte hard drive. Now, I do remember that there was one time that I actually got this drive to spin up in some form of Linux. I don't remember what it was. I think I was dinking around with Kubuntu or something and I think I got it to spin up and then it actually showed me the full two terabyte capacity of the drive but that was the only ever time I actually got it to spin up. I'm not quite sure. But we're gonna try it anyway. And if all else fails, I think what I'm gonna go ahead and try to do is I just wanna see if I can reliably use this computer to store files. Because uh, again, the free license, I don't care if this thing goes poop because I got it for free. I mean, it would suck because this is a nice system that runs Windows 7 and 10 decently well. But no matter. So, um, how, am I, how I was thinking about doing this, and because uh, there's no extra one of those special hard drive caddy style things that allows this drive to be sort of toolless or something, and something just fell off, I'm not sure what just happened, whatever, um, I'm going to put it up here right above the card reader, I think I can do that, it's got one of these little toolless sliding thingies but they also put the they put these stupid zip ties right in the way so I don't know how I'm going to do this because my SATA cable is not exactly long I might have to steal the other one out of my HP Pavilion A6500F really not sure how I'm going to do this but my intentions are if I can do it right <sighs> stuff's falling on the floor as always my room's a mess as always um, maybe we could just shove the drive down into this area. Maybe. I know there's going to be a lot of tech heads that are going to be screaming my name, but you know what? I don't really give a crap. This stuff comes cheaper by the dozen over here. And I say that as I break a lot of stuff. Uh, let's see. Where's the SATA ports on this motherboard? Yes, the optical drive is IDE. Um, that's just how low end the system is. That's how it was built. I want to say I need a longer SATA cable. This one's probably not going to work. So I do have a donor system for SATA cables, at least at the moment. I don't know if I'm going to need any longer SATA cables, which would mean I have to go out to my shop and have to get probably my Inspiron 530. Uh, well, this one's got a right angle plug on it, so maybe I might be able to get it to work. I'm not sure. Is it? Yeah, it is a little longer. This is not an HP part, actually. I just noticed that. I'm hoping that the right angle is at the right angle. No pun intended. 
to actually plug this cable in and get this to work. Maybe. We'll have to see here. Can I plug it in like this, like that, upside down, in these SATA ports? Or is it just going to be one of those things where it's at a stupid angle and I have to plug the cable in like this, which totally defeats the purpose of the right angle? I bet you that's exactly what's going to happen. Is it's one of them stupid SATA ports where you got to plug the cable in at this dumb angle and it blocks all the other SATA ports. Oh. Or maybe it's not. I'm just not seeing things properly. What the hell? There we go. Okay. It did go in at the proper angle. Thank God. So now we're going to have to sneak this around the power supply cable. Or maybe actually, no, let's not do that. Um, actually, we do. I have to sneak it around this way. But what I might end up doing actually is just to save some time. I might just use this already existing SATA cable that's already connected to this hard drive here and plug it into this one and then just use that one cable I just plugged in onto that drive. Uh, I don't know if that's going to work, but uh, it might just work. You know, I also just got to thinking, swap ends of the cable, use the right angle on the drive, because <laughs> this is a pain in the ass already. Uh, I can't even tell where the SATA port is on the drive. Oh god, I need a flashlight. See, when you come into a Jordan Woolery live stream, don't expect anything to go to plan. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, let's just go ahead and get a flashlight on here. Using the quality Galaxy S6 Edge. And uh, I hate the position of this flashlight LED, but uh, it's whatever. It'll work. Just watch me knock the damn phone over. Uh, la, la, la. I think if I can get it around the bend here, get fit in there. Ah, you see, guys, I need a phone tripod, but yeah, there we go. Okay, it did go in. Sweet. So, state cable is in. Awesome. I didn't think of this. Do we have an extra SATA power cable going down here? Because if we don't, I'm screwed. <laughs> oh dear. I didn't think this one through. Um, we got a problem. We have a 6-pin for the PCIe graphics, but I don't think... Unless it's tucked up into here... Uh, that's another Molex. Uh, oh dear. Oh dear. We don't have a second state of power cable. Are you serious? Well, there goes the idea of using another drive as a boot drive. <laughs> I was just wanting to use one drive anyway. I gotta set the phone down here real quick. I was just wanting to use one drive anyway. It'll save on energy consumption. The only crappy thing is it's going to affect the performance because I am using one drive for everything and this might not work. So that's going to be the sucky bit. But I'm going to leave the system just like this when we go to actually install a Windows server. And uh, don't turn the flashlight off here. This SATA cable can go back into this system, but I'll do that here in a moment. When in doubt, just find your local HP Pavilion A6500F. Great donor system. Excuse my mess on the desk. <laughs> I'm not a very organized person, as you can obviously tell. So in other news, um, while that's doing its job, uh, making the USB stick, the uh, Seaside, Seaside, well, it's based in Seaside at this day. Um, the Manzanita Trip 2017 videos. Um, I'm having to split day three into multiple parts, hopefully not multiple, hopefully just a couple. We'll see how it goes. I've condensed it down quite a bit. So as you can see, there's not a lot of time on this video. And as a matter of fact, it might not even be that long. I'm thinking if I scroll through here, I'm probably just gonna go ahead and end the first day, or the third day here, sorry, part one, 
right here at the end of this virtual machine because that's when the file corruption started to begin. I'm having file corruption problems and it wasn't just with my iPhone, it was also with this ZTE uh, Max Duo that I was using also as a camera. Uh, the Go the go kart footage that I had, which was taken on this thing, didn't end up going out the way I had planned. Because what ended up happening was, um, find the media, there we are. Scroll up here. The first go kart footage, I'm not sure if I have enough precision here to get it on camera. I don't think I do. But somewhere inside this file, actually, what I'll do is I'll just toss it at the end. I'll just toss that at the end of the thing here. Oh God, that virtual machine is definitely slowing this down. But fortunately, I'm only using this for demonstration purposes. I'm not actually trying to do some serious work here, so it's fine. Notice there's a cutout and it just goes black. So that's what's throwing iMovie over. And it's telling me every time that it gets to that spot because it thinks that the video is done when it hits that blank part. And it every time I just I keep getting export errors because notice if I advance the frames here, eventually it will see. That's what ended up happening. Mmm, corruption quality. Crap like this ended up happening to the footage on the Android. And. Through all that corruption, there's no audio until it hits right there. So, yeah. That's the kind of crap I'm going through with that right now. It, it sucks, but that's what I'm dealing with. So, any day now you can finish off your install.wim file there. Also, I got some different coffee creamer recently. Got white chocolate macadamia. Tastes pretty interesting. Not sure if I like it. I'm so used to drinking Coffee Mate French Vanilla. I, I bought some International Delight white chocolate macadamia. And uh, I don't know. It was the only stuff that was on sale because everything else was not for sale. It was annoying. And around here, the typical size of coffee creamer stuff that you normally see at like Walmart or something. It costs around four dollars here. No exaggeration. <laughs> for the coffee made stuff, it's like four dollars and nineteen cents for just a standard little thing of well not the standard little thing. Let me show you here. Let me quick let me just unplug my phone. <sighs> Gotta walk through the house here. Gotta be quiet because my mom's asleep. She's not feeling so good. But like one of these uh jobbies. What is the ounce size on this? 32 ounces. Gotta pay a whopping four dollars for that stuff. Or is it Walmart? Because there's a city we live in, or live, nah, we go to occasionally where family's at that's about a couple hours away. And I suppose you could probably get that stuff for like less than three bucks. And that's not on sale or something like Walmart. So, needless to say, when you live in a small town, you pay the price. <laughs> and I mean it. And you know what's kind of annoying is. And I see this all the time. Um, when you go to a gas station to go and buy like a one liter of Mountain Dew, for example, what ends up happening is, is that um, you get ripped off so badly that you'd be better off going to the grocery store and buying a two liter of soda versus buying a one liter of soda. That's how bad it is. <laughs> Like around here, most of the time you can probably find a two liter of soda for like less than a dollar. Including up in the cities, you can buy two liters for less than a dollar. Whereas one liter sodas are over two dollars. It's ridiculous. So you'd just be better off buying the two liter instead of a one liter. You can just pour over ice. Who really gives a crap if it's refrigerated already? I'm not paying the price for that. Are you kidding me? And also 20 ounces are ridiculously priced as well. Anyway, enough of the topic of soda pop. I mean, it's really not that good for you, but I drink it anyway because I'm a fat, lazy butt. <laughs> anyway. I drink more coffee than I do soda anyway. Although that's sometimes a lie. <laughs> anyway. 
What are you doing, dork? <laughs> what are you doing? I don't know why, but she likes to hide in that corner. What are you doing? What? What? Meow. <laughs> Goofy cat. <laughs> Now, I tried to actually install Windows Server 2016 on a virtual machine. Needless to say, it didn't work. <laughs> what ended up happening was it couldn't find some license file. I don't know what. And it could be that I even got a bad ISO, which I doubt, but could totally be possible. And it would just endlessly reboot. It would get stuck on an error message, and then you press OK, and it would just reboot. It would not let you set it up. So I'm hoping that that's not going to be the same thing here. Because if so, it's going to turn into a Draugr 1 video really quickly. <laughs> Here's the hoping that's not going to be the case. And yes, by the way, I use my Max secondary display as a secondary monitor instead of having to use a third monitor, which is right over there. I mean, that other monitor, I'm not saying it's bad, but uh, the quality is not nearly as good as this one even though this one has over or under scan sorry and whenever you put in a 1080p image into this and the monitor is not properly recognized what ends up happening is is that it gets a lot of under scan i mean 15 percent under scan so you get a huge black border dork what are you doing like legitimately what are you doing this cat is so random Precious. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing. But, I don't know, I've contemplated what I'm going to do with this monitor. I mean, I don't really use two monitors too much. They do come in handy, and I found a lot of use for them, but I don't know. I mostly just use this for, like, iMovie, and I either put iMovie on there or I watch stuff on that monitor, whatever. I do like it to where I can have a virtual machine in full screen on one monitor and I can do other work on the other monitor because Mac OS is very flexible when it comes to secondary displays. And so literally the nice thing is, is that I can literally just press the mission control key and I can literally just take this and pop it onto a secondary display and I can do some work here on the Mac. Completely independent from Windows. And yes, I do have boot camp, but I didn't want to leave Mac OS because I have a bunch of stuff open that, yeah, <laughs> I got to delete that because that's not going into that day, or at least that part of the day. So, yeah. We're almost done here. This is about as long as it would take on my workstation, my HP XW6600, which I hope to get working. The only problem is, is I need to get a graphics card for it. And I don't know what graphics card I really want to get. The problem is I have to get one that will comply with a DDR2 ECC system. And the last graphics card that I had in it was a GeForce GTX 960. As a matter of fact, I even have the box up here for it. This is the exact card that I got for my workstation is this, a 4 gig GDDR5 GTX 960. This is a decent card. It wasn't the best, but it allowed me to play 1080p pretty well with that system, despite the limitation of the memory bandwidth on the on the motherboard. And uh, it obviously supports DirectX 12. But I used this card, and it worked very well. It did much better than my GTX 650, which I actually still have that graphics card somewhere. Um, I don't know what... Uh, oh, it was in the workstation, right. And that card is officially done for. Um, I don't know what's wrong with it, but anytime you go to install the driver, it will literally just lock up the system. Um, it's so bad. I'm pretty sure there's like some kind of like bad memory chip or something because anytime you go to install the driver, the, uh, the text and some window things get screwed up so badly that it'll literally just crash the driver in an endless loop until the system blue screens and restarts because of the driver. It's that bad. <laughs> and um, I have tried putting that graphics card motherboard in the oven. I've taken off the cooler, taken off the heat sink, took off the back plate, 
thumb screws, that sort of thing, and just tossed the little graphics card board in the oven. And uh, I think it was on like, what did I toss that thing on? I think it was at 350 for like seven minutes, I think it was in, that was in there. Six or seven minutes, I tossed it in there at 350. And then I let it cool off overnight, reinstalled everything on the graphics card. Because it used to be that it was so bad that any time you would actually install the driver, the system would immediately lock up. But it got back to the point of where it was all corrupted again. So my guess is, is that since I've already considered the card a write-off, I might just re I might just disassemble it once again and throw it back in the oven. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to do. Toss it back in the oven, do a second round of treatment on the card, and see if that will help it out even more. Do again like six or seven minutes at 350 degrees in the oven. And uh, if the card totally borks out, then I'm not out anything because the card's already right off. So really it's just for experimentation. If I get that card to work, that'd be the perfect graphics card for my, my XW6600 because the 650 plays decently well. Granted, it's not nearly as fast as I would like it to be, but the 650 does an okay job. I'm thinking if, if the 650 is a write-off, I'm just going to save up money and I'm just going to go ahead and buy a, a 1050 for that workstation because uh, a 1030, a GT 1030 would be a little too underpowered for what I'd like to do with it. So I'd probably just get a, a f what I'd probably get, a 4 gig 1050 Ti, probably something like that. And if I'm feeling really lucky and the crypto miners aren't too harsh on the pricing of graphics cards, I might get a 6 gig 1060. I'm not sure. I've contemplated a 6 gig 1060, but I don't think that'd be worth it for an old ECC DDR2 system. I mean, it might be worth it for a later system, but, you know, you know. Anyway, Rufus is done. So now we can go ahead and eject the USB stick here. So let's do that. See, this is the trouble with VMware, you can literally eject the hard drive right there. <laughs> so you gotta watch out. Uh, balloon should pop up any second now. Yep, we're ready to go. So, now I can go ahead and put this USB stick inside of the computer. And we can actually, literally, bring the Mac mouse out, pause the virtual machine. That's the beauty of VMware. That's why I really like it. So, it does come in handy. So now I can literally just freeze it there and I can continue on with my work. Simple as that. Very nice. All right. So if you will excuse me, I need to pop the USB stick quite literally. Nah, that's just a joke. Into the back of the computer and move my headphones and we can go ahead and power up here. Assuming, um, wait, hang on. Assuming I have the power cable plugged in, which I don't. Okay, good. I won't make myself look like a fool on the live stream. <sighs> All right, here we go. Smoke test. Okay, I forget what the boot menu is on the system. Because it doesn't tell you right on the boot screen. I think it's one of them keys. I'm not sure. Like HDD smart area. Yeah, see, there's the drive I'm trying to get to work. I think it'll boot right off the USB. That would be smite. That would, I can't speak today. That would be nice if it did. I don't think so though. So control delete. Oh. Okay, never mind. It is working. Okay, cool. Oh god, don't tell me it's running in USB 1.1 mode. Oh, uh, it's running in USB 1.1 mode. Dang it. Well, the fact that it's actually loading the files, I'll take that. You really can't tell the contrast on that now, can you? There you go. You can see just how slow it's loading. Now, it would have been nice if I could use a DVD, but the problem is I don't have dual-layer DVDs. I only have the single-layer DVDs, so... That's the sucky thing. I don't have dual layers. And no, they don't sell dual layers here. I have to drive to the next state over to buy dual layer DVDs, and that's like a minimum hour drive round trip. Maybe an hour and a half or two hours if you want to factor in the fact that I have to get gas in my truck. 
uh, not to mention Oregon traffic and whatnot. So, no thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. So, a USB stick's more than good enough. I mean, I probably could have used this 128 gig, but I think I've got some important files on that, so I don't feel like erasing it right now. So. I gotta get me more coffee here in a second. My mug's gone cold. <laughs> you know, last night I was actually watching Vine Sauce Joel's stream with Grand Theft Auto Vice City, and I gotta say, that was a hilarious stream. It was also very well done. I mean... <laughs> I mean, what better way to make a stream than to play Grand Theft Auto Vice City? Honestly, though, I'd rather play through probably GTA 3 first before I get into Vice City. Because I own pretty much all of the Grand Theft Autos that are relevant. Except for the episodes from Liberty City and Vice City Stories. Um, and they never made a... Liberty City Stories on PC. I have it on iOS, though, so I probably play it on my iPhone 6S, and I just record it through QuickTime on the iMac. I can actually do that. And the cool thing is, um, I have 60 FPS with the iPhone 6S. Now, I don't know if the iMac would actually have the transfer rate to keep up with that, but I might experiment with that. But, um, no, I might play through GTA 3 on the PC. What I would I'd probably do, if this system doesn't end up working out, or I might just use this other system over here, I might use my HP A6500F, since it has a 3.33 gigahertz Core 2 Duo, and it has Windows 7. What I might do, I might put all the classic Grand Theft Autos on there, and what I might do is take the... I know I have one of these. I have a GeForce... 9800 GT. Hello there, zero error. Um, I'm streaming from my phone, so sorry I don't have any kind of like chat thing on one side of the screen. Maybe someday I might. But anyway, um, I want to put my GeForce 9800 GT, which is a 512 megabyte card, and put it into that system there. And then I can pretty much play GTA 3 through GTA 4 on that system. I'm really not sure. I'm contemplating it, though. Um, the only thing is that card is only DirectX 10.1, which really isn't that big of a deal, because Grand Theft Auto 4, I think, is a DirectX 9 game. Uh, period, question mark. I think it runs in DirectX 9. So that's really not that big of a deal. Um, and plus, that card actually can handle GTA 4 decently. The only problem is I was initially trying to run the game on a 1.8 gigahertz core 2 duo and needless to say it, it ran it ran pretty well but as many of you might know that's the minimum cpu requirement for gta 4 in terms of a dual core cpu of course if you're running a pentium 4 god help you <laughs> but um no i think a 1.8 gigahertz core 2 duo is the minimum cpu on that game i'd have to look it up on steam but I'd like to try it with a 3.33 gigahertz Core 2 Duo and a 9800 GT and see if that'll actually run. Not sure. Um, the limitations of that system is it has only four gigabytes of RAM. So, yeah, I don't have like uh, dual four gig sticks to make eight gigs. I only have four gigs, so that's probably going to be an issue. But I think it might be okay. You know, it'd be so nice if this was running in USB 2.0 mode, but it's running in USB 1.1 mode, so it's taking a legendary amount of time to load the files. I mean, heck, this would have loaded faster if it was on DVD. I'm not joking. But unfortunately, like I mentioned prior, I only have single-layer DVDs. I don't have dual-layer DVDs, and it would cost me quite a bit of money 
to drive to the next state over, which is a minimum round trip of about two hours round trip to do the whole entire job. And honestly, I don't think it's worth my time and money to go and buy dual layer DVDs that I'm probably never going to use. So USB stick will work, but for some reason it's loading in the wrong mode. So it's taking absolutely forever to boot up, but it seems to be working now. So that's good. Now, my biggest worry is that it's not going to properly detect the hard drive. That's going to be my biggest problem because on the BIOS, it said that there was some kind of like smart error. And the problem with that is I, there's got to be like some kind of way that you can actually unlock this drive and access the full two terabyte capacity. But most of the time, whenever you access this drive, it only shows up as 128 gigabytes, which is annoying. Not sure why that is, but it's not the limitation of the SATA controller because pretty much all the SATA equipped computers I own, they go up to a two terabyte maximum. So this drive in theory would work and it's detected in its full capacity by the BIOS. So I'm not sure what's going on. It's gotta be some kind of problem that I'm just not seeing. Alrighty, Windows Server 2016. This looks awfully familiar, and I'm using the absolutely wrong mouse for this. Put my keyboard tray away here. All right, English, United States, everything is normal. Pretty typical setup process. Now, I tried this on a virtual machine, and it, it gave me an error at this stage. So here's the hoping it's not the case here, because I can't spend, like, three hours re-downloading a six and a half gig ISO. I'm not joking, that's how long it took. <laughs> I don't have a gigabit network. Oh, thank God. Oh, nice, I got a news notification. Obamacare straight repeal fails on Senate vote. Nice, I'll read that later. <laughs> like I give a crap about that. Okay, so what I wanna do, I wanna do the Windows Server 2016 standard evaluation, but you gotta watch out, cause you have to, yes, Technically, the Windows 10 and 8 setup is very similar to that of the Windows 7 and Vista setup. It's literally the same exact thing. It's been unchanged since 2007, which is pretty impressive. The only things that they've really changed, excuse me, excuse me, are the background and this has gone opaque versus being a transparent glass, but literally everything else has been unchanged. But you gotta watch out because if you want a graphical user interface, you have to select the desktop experience. That's how Windows Server 2016 has always done things. You have to watch out for that. So if you just pick the standard one, you don't get a graphical user interface at all. So you want this. And besides, I want to remotely manage this server through remote desktop connections, so I do want the GUI. And this system does have four gigabytes of memory, so it meets the minimum requirements. And it's also, I believe, a 2 point something gigahertz CPU. I'm really not sure. I don't believe that um, the command prompt at this stage would actually tell me. It'll tell me when we get into the operating system. Oh, hey, cool. The drive spun up and I actually have the full two terabytes. Sweet. Okay, my fear is gone now. Okay, that's awesome. So what is it saying? Windows cannot be installed to this disk. So computer hardware may not be or may not support booting to this disk. Ensure that the disk's controller is enabled in the computer's BIOS menu. Interesting. Well, what I want to do, um, real quick, let's ask our great and mighty Siri. Maybe if she ever comes up, this is not exactly speedy for Siri. What's 1,024 times 32? You can see just how laggy it is. <laughs> it's 32,768. And if you're wondering, I have the Irish female accent set for no reason whatsoever. Okay. So we want to erase this because I just want a boot partition. So, whoops, that's definitely not the size I want. 32,768. That'll give me a 32 gig partition. It's probably still not gonna let me install, but it can get wrecked. And I'm just gonna leave the rest of the drive unallocated. That's my intention. So hopefully it will let me install to this. I'm not sure. 
have had experience installing Windows Server 2012 R2 before. Or was it? Oh, hello. Couldn't create a new partition. We got a hexadecimal code. That's no fun. Um, yeah, that's not fun at all. I bet you that drive has not spun up at all. Although I can't hear if it's running because it's so dang quiet. I guess we'll get down on the floor here and we'll figure that out. Because I can't tell if it's spun up or not. This drive does not spin up usually. It requires some like specially crafted request on the SATA bus. I can't tell if it's spun up. I really can't hear it. Um, one thing I can try though, we can try this again. We're just gonna go ahead and say new, let's partition the whole hard drive. Let's see, is the hard drive light on? Because the green light's the power light. There's a red power, or red power, red hard drive light. And nothing's going on, it seems. So, uh, nothing. Uh, yeah, I just got the same hexadecimal error saying we couldn't create a new partition, so that's not fun. Um, so, let's do this. Let's see, Shift F10. And uh, you can tell that this is based on the anniversary update of Windows 10 because the build number is 14393. And let's see if we can access C. Okay. Oh, that's the RAM disk, sorry. That's the RAM disk that this makes. That's why it's showing up. D, I think, is on the card reader. I'm not sure. Walmart confirms it's canceling every single SNES Classic pre-order. Really? I'll tell Apple News to save for later because I'm doing a live stream right now. You know, it might be a good idea. Uh, plug my phone back in, because it's getting kind of warm. And uh, needless to say, when it does that, that means the battery is draining at a really bad rate. There. So, let's see. Um, it makes a 24... Is that 24 gigs? I'm not sure. But... Um, Clearly, we're having a problem with drive allocation here. So, um, I think the these other ones are actually the card reader. I'm not sure. Uh, there's no floppy drives in this system. I don't think H exists. No, there is an H. Okay. Yeah, there's no I. So, my guess is D is the hard drive. E, F, G, H, and I. Yeah, E, F, G, and H are the card reader. D is the hard drive, so we need to format D. Ah. Uh, well, screw you then. Well, anyway, um, let's take a look at Task Manager while we're in here. Oh, contrast is ugly. Let's do text. You can tell how bad the uh, underscan of, of this monitor is. A lot of this text is italicized, which is kind of weird. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what else to do here, honestly. Let's just end CSRSS.exe. Oh, wait, we can't. Ha 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 ha, I'm funny. Okay, um, so let's reboot. Uh, we're gonna just do this handy dandy thing called reset button. <laughs> bet, you, bet you wish your Windows PC today had that sort of feature. I think setup is delete. Yes, it is. See, there's the hard drive. It just says smart error. I'm really not sure what they mean by that. The fact is it's detecting the drive. Oh, now it's not in the BIOS. Interesting. Huh. Well, that's weird. You stupid cat. For frig's sake. Crap over. Anyway. 
And there goes my headphones, of course, because nothing ever stays where it's at, despite being on a flat surface. Uh, it's not going to give me what I want. Yeah, I... I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I don't care about the Windows 10 drive that's in there now because it was just a test install. And ironically, I, I got a free copy of Windows 10 in 2017. <laughs> no surprise there. So let's just redirect the power from the two terabyte for now over to the 320 gig that's in the system. And then for now, we'll just install Windows Server onto that because I'm just going to test that thing. But for the moment, what I want to do, we'll take out the USB stick. I want to make a partition on the drive for Windows Server and then it makes a ton of beeps when it boots up. It's kind of weird. No device detected. Oh, great. Let me guess the SATA cable came unplugged on the hard drive. Well, isn't that always productive? You fucking serious? I hate this system because you so much as touch one thing and then it stops working. And believe me, I had a fight with the SATA cable. It's not the SATA cable, it's actually something to do with the motherboard, I'm pretty sure. Because um, one day the drive just would not show up. The hard drive just would not show up for whatever reason. And now this is going to take two hands. Great. So, I fought with it for like forever. And then out of complete random, the drive just showed up and started working again. So, I don't know if it's the hard drive, I doubt it, but it could be, if I get this damn SATA cable in there, come on. Yeah, quality streaming at its best, there we go. Disconnect the old one. There. Also, this motherboard has a light-up LED down there. You can hear all the beeping it does. I think that blue light's supposed to be the hard drive light. Oh good, picked up the hard drive this time. Good, I don't have to sit there and fight with 10,000 times of unplugging the SATA cable. <laughs> good. You can see just how quickly it actually boots up. It's not too bad, but uh, it's not perfect. And also, once again, you can tell lots of underscan, lots of underscan. Because I tried installing the AMD graphics driver and it did jack crap. I have no options. So I'm going to have to go back and install the Windows 7 driver because the Windows 8 driver is terrible. And I get this horrible underscan, which is just stupid. All right. I need to unplug real quickly while this boots up. And I need to come over here and I need to turn on the compressor on this thing. Because it's getting hot in this room and I don't know why but anytime I work on these computers it just gets so hot unbearably hot for no reason so yeah so what we want to do I want to go up here to this PC right click and I want to go to manage this drives not exactly the fastest but it's serviceable enough to do the job uh, let's see here. I wish everything was right angle. Stay on iMac. Come on, computer. Come on, computer. Computer, why you no work? I need more coffee. It's like 1.30 for me. I need more coffee already.
You know, it'd be so much easier if I could just do this on a virtual machine, but it just didn't work. So that's making it very difficult. Okay, there we are, finally, computer management. All right, so we want to go to disk management. Make the window bigger. And then we have this big partition, which I'm gonna shrink. So we need to right click, shrink volume. I'm gonna change this to a 64 gig drive. All right, I need to ask Siri the magic word. What's 1024 times 64? It's 65,536. All right, so we want to shrink it down to be 65536. So we're just gonna go ahead and shrink this down. Because the rest of that space I'm just gonna use for Windows Server. And maybe I can make a dual boot setup, I'm really not sure. So, do, 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 do. it's gonna take a while. <laughs> this is blockbuster film quality entertainment as it's at its best right now. Do, 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 do. Oh god, this is gonna take forever. Can we just do this? There we go, that's a lot better. No sense in waiting every freaking time. All right, six, five, five, three, six. Whoops, I passed it. No, I'm not. I know you really can't read this too well. All right. Six, five, five, three, six, shrink. And repartition the hard drive. And that should then turn into a 64 gig partition. Hopefully. Maybe. Maybe someday. Don't no, no guarantees. There's not enough space available on the disk to complete this operation. Uh, I, I call bull crap on that, but okay. Because <laughs> uh, we have 84% free. So I call bull crap with that one. Anyway. Well, whatever. If I nuke this drive, who really gives a crap? Because... Honestly, I can just reinstall Windows 10. Oh, yay! Good old Microsoft behind my back installing games that I'm never going to play. Typical. Let's see how Minecraft Windows 10 Edition plays since it installed it. Oh. So why did it say it recently added it, but it takes me to the store? Is Candy Crush Soda Saga installed? No. Okay. How about this Bubble Witch 3 Saga? Nope. It's installing March of Empires, War of Lords. But we're going to restart before it starts thinking about it. <laughs> there you can really see just how bad the underscan is with a solid color. It is awful. And now my internet's saying very bad connection. As it always does. Because the internet around here apparently sucks so bad that it can't handle my streaming for a while and then it'll just give out and never resume again and then I have to go fuck with the router for half an hour until it decides to work by some miracle because that's how everything is around here as it works under luck just like a Drago 1 video so okay so uh, off turn the system off okay we're going to pop the USB stick on the front USB ports this time and see if that improves the boot speed, because that boot speed last time was like a good 15 minutes. I'm not about to wait that long. No, thank you. Wait, actually, I should probably go into the BIOS and go to. Uh, la, 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 la. I think it's under advanced. No. No, it's not. Um, where's the boot order? I like how it doesn't show any SATA drives on there because it has its own sort of like hybrid RAID thing that it does. So it makes no sense. All right, that's where you overclock it. I'm not gonna do that right now. Okay, function as boot. 
And that's going to be the first one. Yep. So, okay. So this is where you would update the BIOS. I think there is BIOS updates for this, but yeah, there would be because it's 2006 on the BIOS copyright. So I'm assuming there's probably going to be some kind of like BIOS update. I'll look that up later. Anyway, save and exit setup since I set it to boot off the USB stick. Maybe. This actually isn't half bad of a motherboard. I really want to get it a Phenom 2X4. I do honestly want to say that it's booting off the hard drive for fuck's sake. Come on. Reset. <laughs> I do honestly miss having my AMD 6 core custom build system because that was an AMD Phenom 2X6 1090T. And that system was just beast. There we go. So USB, press any key, of course I will. And let it boot up off USB stick. And it's back to booting in USB 1.1 mode. So that's gonna take a while. So while we're doing that, yes, EMS enabled setup. And it's gonna take a bloody long time to load everything. Look how long that's gonna load. It's gonna take absolutely forever. Anyway, um, we're gonna go into MSI's website here. Just MSI support. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna see if we can find any kind of BIOS updates for this. Ooh, their stock's down. Huh. <laughs> okay, so, enter product name for quick search. This is an MSI, I think it's 785 GTM. Dash E45. I don't know if that's the right model number. Guess we'll find out and see. Yep, 75 GTM E45. This is the Entertainment Series motherboard. And there's that lovely picture. This motherboard does not support Windows 98 or ME. I don't know why you'd want to install that on a motherboard this new. <laughs> Somebody might. But um, anyway, um, it's got a bunch of stuff that you can do. Easy overclock switch. Has powered USB ports, which is actually kind of cool, which is odd because it says support Windows 98 SE, ME, 2000, and XP, but apparently I can't install Windows 98 on this motherboard. Can you like proofread your freaking specs list god i hate when people do that completely inconsistent marketing like it makes no sense why would you say you can't install 98 or me but your usb charging feature supports 98 or me on the motherboard like ffs god okay so Bio state, uh, sixteen point six. Um, drivers, okay. So it supports XP Vista and seven. Not bad. Although I don't know if it supports Windows Server two thousand sixteen. I'm gonna do it anyway. I mean, that's actually weird that you can actually install Windows XP on the system. Hmm. Not like I'd ever do that, but <laughs> hey, the support's there in case you ever wanted to. The fact that it actually has the drivers for XP still is kind of impressive. But I'd probably go ahead and download that file, actually. That might come in handy for later. I don't know if the BIOS has been updated, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because, again, if it, if it borks the system, I'm not on anything because this is a freebie. So, yeah. But there's that lovely motherboard in red. Which is odd because my motherboard is the black colored version, not the red colored version. I guess that's some kind of like reference model or something. But uh, anyway, we're halfway through loading. Hopefully it'll finish here in this century. That air conditioner is kind of noisy and I've actually had problems with it leaking water out where that power cord is and I've had it start leaking water and it starts dripping and so it's not fun to clean up because you, you end up spending like an hour waiting for the leaking to stop it's really annoying 
I know it's not really insulated at all, so that might be my problem, is it's dehumidifying through the power cord, which is not fun. But this is all I have to work with right now because I don't have any kind of insulation material. So that'll have to do. And I've kind of pushed my towel out of the way, so no wonder. I'll have to fix that outside. So, whatever. I'm not going to do that here on the live stream unless, of course, it starts leaking water. <laughs> so, yeah. What's weird is they advertise using Internet Explorer 8 or Firefox 3 or above to download BIOS or drivers. Who the frig still supports Internet Explorer 8? Like, honestly, nothing should support Internet Explorer anymore. Edge, yeah, Edge is fine. But Internet Explorer, except for version 11, no. Like, honestly. So, yeah. It's going to be interesting, though, because I bet you Microsoft's going to cut off the Internet Explorer support date early. But the funny thing is, is that Windows 8.1 is still going to be supported until 2023. So I wonder how Microsoft's going to cope up with that one, because a lot of people are probably still going to be using Internet Explorer 11 if they're still using Windows 8.1 in 2023. So, yeah. I think Internet Explorer 10 had its support drop from it recently. I'm not sure. I think the only one that was dropped, the only one that's still supported is Internet Explorer 11, because I know 10, 9, well, any other version of Internet Explorer versus 11 that was previously supported had its support dropped. So that would include the Windows 8.0 version of Internet Explorer, which was 10, which worked on Windows 7 as well. So, yeah, it makes sense why they do that. But, uh, yeah. Still loading. Someday we'll get there. In the meantime, we're just going to close that out. I think maybe we'll go ahead and pop that up for no reason whatsoever. I'm trying to mouse over the other screen. I can't do that. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm not running this on a virtual machine. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. So now it should let me set this up. I would have liked to have used the two terabyte hard drive, but clearly I can't right at the moment. One, because for one thing, um, it won't let me install to it in the first place. And two, um, I don't have more than one serial ATA power connector, which is very annoying. It looks like you started an upgrade and booted from installation media. If you want to continue with the upgrade, remove the media from your PC and click yes. If you want to perform a clean installation, instead click no. Interesting. It must have detected that I was running Windows 10, and it says that, so no. Uh, next, install now. Because I want to do a clean installation of Windows Server 2016 standard with the graphical user interface, because I don't want to have it as a command line, if there is even any kind of interface at all. So I want the desktop experience. And we accept the evaluation license terms because this is exactly what this is. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and press delete on all these partitions. And we're gonna do new, and we're gonna do the same, uh, let's see, 32768. I pressed enter. I'm pressing enter. Why you no register me, press enter. For frig's sake, come on. Anyway, 32 gig boot partition. Should be good enough. They say the minimum you want to use for your operating system is 32 gigs. And that's what I'm going to do because I'm not planning on installing pretty much anything else other than the OS and some of the features, such as, of course, the file server add-on and the, uh, the audio and video stuff and other things that I normally like to use, uh, which is probably why this is a 6 gig operating system. But uh, finally, we can get all the insulation. It looks now it's actually in USB 2.0 mode. So now it's actually copying at a more reasonable pace. So that's good. You can tell just how much they've really simplified the setup process. It's installing features, installing updates, finishing up, getting files ready for installation. I remember when that used to say expanding files, and it actually made a lot more sense back then because this is an image-based install of Windows. So, yeah. So while that does its thing, 
we're gonna go ahead and go get us some coffee. Excusing the mess, that is my, kind of my dormitory, which I, I call it the mess hall. <laughs> get us some more coffee here. Yes. I can hear maybe in a little bit. Oops. All oh, right, I gotta, I gotta pour out my old stuff. Ew. Dorky cat. All right. Everybody's favorite segment on my channel. Good old coffee. Or some people might call it Kofefi. I'm moving this poor unit around a lot. Now, if this is an actual published video, this would be really shoddy. I do much better quality videos than this live stream right now, but that just shows you how much of an amateur I am when it comes to actually doing these things. So there's that coffee creamer I actually got. I'm not sure. I mean, I gotta get used to it. I'm so used to drinking French vanilla. <laughs> of course. Creamerholic, but it's whatever. What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't get bunked by the fridge. What? <laughs> You're so random. Goofy cat. That cat's a dork. She's the goofiest of cats, honestly. I gotta clean that up off the stove, great. Back into the mess emporium. We made it to 38%, 39%, yay, cool. The cat's a complete dork though, <laughs> honestly. She acts so random. So, I'm gonna do like what Bob Pony does. I'm gonna go ahead and open up Task Manager. Keep an eye on the system resource usages, or usage level, sorry. Only using a gig of RAM, and I say that, and it starts going up now as it starts caching the files. So this thing should do pretty well. Although this is just the installation screen. You know, there's actually this one time, and I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a storytelling I actually installed Windows Server 2008 R2 on a single Pentium D960 system. Yeah, when I mean Pentium D960, I mean the, the behemoth 3.6 gigahertz uh, Pentium D chip, which runs so hot. <laughs> I mean, it really does run hot. Because um, if you don't know about the Pentium D, it's essentially literally just uh, two Pentium 4s duct taped together and called a dual core <laughs> that's exactly what that is um with the hyper threading disabled of course but um really it was kind of a, a rushed and shoddy design by intel to rush a dual core out onto the market to try and compete with amd's then new x2 series of processors and as well as the opteron and um intel should have done a much better job on that they literally just took two pentium 4s and squeezed them together which is a terrible idea. But uh, the fun thing is, it actually ran pretty well. I mean, the Pentium D960 is actually not that bad of a processor. I mean, it actually handles daily tasks pretty well. It's definitely older and slower. Don't get me wrong, they're based on the Pentium 4, obviously. And I think mine's actually a later Cedar Mill based version, I'm not sure. I think they're under the same code name as the Pentium 4. I think I have a Cedar Mill Pentium D960. I'm not sure. I think there were. I'd have to look that up, actually. Internet to the rescue. It's not Kool-Aid, man. It's the internet. <laughs> okay. Pent whoops. Pentium D960. And uh, I bought this off eBay and had the case badge and thermal paste, and, or thermal grease, if you want to call it that, and everything. I mean, the thing was just ridiculous. 
Pressler. That's what it was called, it was Pressler. I thought it was Cedar Mill, but I guess they don't call it the same thing. Interesting that they brand it with the modern Pentium branding, even though it's nowhere near that. But yeah, this thing was ridiculous back in the day. $316 back when it was new. Whew! Yeah, that thing was ridiculously expensive. And it was also ridiculously hot running. So, yeah. 69% done. Come on, Windows. Honestly, though, I really should have picked a beefier system like a quad core, like a core 2 quad. But honestly, this will do the job just for evaluation purposes because this is the handiest system that I have that I actually don't care about the installation of Windows that it has. Excuse me. So... Yeah. I was actually looking at the minimum system requirements for server 2016 standard, and it's kind of interesting to see the kind of um, requirements that they would recommend. Uh, basically, the main requirements are you have a 1.4 gigahertz 64-bit capable CPU. It doesn't have to be dual core. They just say you need a 1.4 gigahertz 64-bit capable processor and what's weird is if you're not installing it with the graphical user interface they say you can run it on 512 megs of memory but you either have to do one of two things at setup you either have to install more than 800 megabytes of ram or you have to manually configure a page file before setup begins um, and then you can actually run it on 512 megs of memory so i can see that as being useful if you're running lots of Windows Server 2016 virtual machines without the graphical user interface installed. So that makes more sense that way. But if you're running it with the graphical user interface, your absolute minimum is 2 gigs of RAM, which makes sense because this is a 64-bit operating system, and that's what the minimum requirement is for Windows 10 64-bit is 2 gigs of RAM. But on the server operating system, they absolutely mean an absolute minimum of 2 gigabytes of memory because this OS is a lot heavier on your hardware than uh, Windows 10 normally is, and even more so on the consumer grade hardware versus the server hardware. So you definitely have to keep that in mind. Um, so when I mean two gigs as an absolute minimum, I'm not joking because, oh, US, UXW build video, sweet. I'll have to watch that later. Um, because this OS is very, very heavy and very, very slow. I remember actually taking a look at the technical previews when it came to this operating system and the final release, I think I explored it a little while ago, and they actually took out a lot of genuinely useful features. Um, I think for one thing, they took out Microsoft Edge and they just left it with Internet Explorer 11. They actually took out Edge, and I think, why not include a more modern, more secure web browser? Like, it would make a lot more sense that way. But they didn't, obviously. They didn't keep it in there. Uh, the second thing that they took out was the store, which, you know, I can I can see that as being a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah, I know, what the heck, and taking out Microsoft Edge. It was in previous technical previews of Server 2016. They had the Edge browser in there, which was actually very useful. Then they took it out and just left it with IE 11, so I don't know what the point of that was. But yeah, the second thing is they took out the store, and I can see that as being a good or bad thing, because... Um, what I saw the advantages of the store for was you could actually, from the store, download and actually have updated server components that you could just readily download or update, install, and configure, and it all run through the Universal Windows Platform interface, which would not only improve performance, but it would also improve security that way. And you could also get some legitimately cool server add-ons, as well as actually, you know, hosting your apps on the Windows Store that way, I suppose, if you had the right frameworks. I think that's an optional component. I'm not sure. I think on the BOG standard uh, version of Server 2016, I think there's some different configuration you have to do to get that stuff to actually work. Not sure on that. But anyway. Um, but no, it would actually be cool to have a, a, a Windows Server-based Windows Store. I think that'd be legitimately cool. Because then you could actually download a lot of useful things that are server-related and it would automatically update and not require reboots and it would improve the security of the server because they're running in a sandboxed environment, I think. So, at least that's my perception of it. I think that's how it would actually work. 
and, it, and I can see that as being a bad thing as well because one thing I can see going wrong is the store could be out of date and that could cause a security problem because it might not actually be updated as often as the administrators might like. So I can see that as being a problem. But at the same time, um, it would automatically update and those updates don't require reboots. I mean, yeah, they might. there might be some kind of scheduled downtime to which you'd have to install updates on that sort of thing and uh, I'm not surprised they didn't find the display driver there. So I can see that as being a problem is you know, you have to maintain not only the operating system itself and the Windows updates, but you have to maintain the Windows Store updates. So I can see that as being a problem. But I honestly do think that the pros would outweigh the cons and that sort of a thing. But again, that's just me. I don't know. The one thing that I do actually like about Server 2016 is they have the Action Center. At least I think there's still the Action Center. Maybe they took that out too, because you know Microsoft. <laughs> but there was this... When I was testing the technical preview. I think it was technical preview 3 or was it technical preview 4? I don't remember what one I was testing but it was based on Windows 10 build uh, 10586 and it actually had the action center and I thought it was legitimately useful that they have that in there because if there's any notifications that came in on the server then they would just pop up in the action center. If someone logged in you'd actually see all the notifications in the Action Center ready to go. You can click on them and solve any of the maintenance problems or see anything that needed to be taken care of all right in one place. And they wouldn't disappear like a balloon would. I don't know how often that would actually be used, but I think it'd be a really cool feature because it would help improve maintaining or it would improve um, maintenance downtimes and stuff like that. And I think it's going to want me to pop in my admin password now. This is what it would make you do. You need to pop in an administrator password at the screen. It takes a while to come up though. But that's just my two cents on that. I mean, obviously I can see the performance and security risks of having those you know, features, but honestly, that would be really nice to have add-ons. Oh, there's the mouse cursor. They would be really nice. I think you can actually install them secondary, I think, I'm not sure, but for the purposes of just this evaluation copy, I'm probably just going to install what I need, not what I don't need. Although I might experiment later, might see how the performance of the remote desktop connection is. And there we go, we got to type in an admin password, so I'm going to turn the camera away here real quick while I do that. Alright, and now we got to probably press Control alt delete to log in here pretty quick. Yippers, and uh, by default, there's no support for wireless networking. You have to add that yourself, which I do need to do. And uh, you can tell this is based on the anniversary update. So, all right. There's probably gonna be a lot of things disabled by default to improve the performance over remote desktop connection. but that's fine. Windows Media Player, oh no. <laughs> I didn't think they'd include that in the server operating system. Get the word out. <laughs> I hear that stupid stuff on the radio all the time. There's this one business that they have that uh, they have a quote that's like, get the word out that sort of thing but freaking Windows Media Player in server 2016 yeah I don't think so <laughs> obviously there's no Cortana but the search function is there so you can quickly launch something so that's actually a legitimately useful thing but yeah see Internet Explorer they're not even hiding anything it's literally Internet Explorer right there on the taskbar <laughs> so yeah so now we gotta wait on the server manager to come up that takes a little bit and this isn't exactly a speedy system, as you've seen. So, there she comes. Why did I just call it a she? There's no gender in this stuff. Unless, of course, I'm assuming the gender, and then that would just be totally incorrect. Okay, I'm done on that topic. <laughs> anyway. So, let's go ahead. I like this animation. It's not saying it's loading anything, it's just this animation that just goes across the screen. It looks really nice.
Anyway, I need to increase the screen resolution here if it will let me. And yes, you do get access to the universal Windows platform settings, which is the older type. But honestly, I prefer this one a lot better because then you get a lot more settings. Uh, we'll see if HDMI supports 1280 by 1024. Oh, it does. Cool. Because then that'll give me more screen real estate to actually configure this stuff and actually see a little bit more. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to configure this local server. And, okay, this is just the event log and services that are running and all that stuff. So as you can see, Microsoft Windows Server 2016 standard evaluation, MicroStar International, it obviously picked it up. So Athlon 2 X2 245 processor, 4 gigabytes of memory, although 256 megs of that are shared for video memory, and 32 gig hard drive. I'm actually kind of curious, how much hard drive space is this actually using? Let's see here, system. Uh, of course, Windows is not activated. I'll have to take care of that. Uh, let's see here. Backslash. on a second. What? Aren't they in the drawer? The drawer to the left of the stove? Like they always are? 10.3 gigs out of 32. Not bad. That is plenty of room. I don't know why they give you such a big window to install your stuff, but I'm not complaining. Okay. So... We're going to go ahead and set up Windows Update here. I suppose we'll have to do that. So let's see, Advanced Options, do this, Defer Feature Updates. Uh, restart Options should be Never, because this is a server. Um, now, i got to enter in some kind of product key. Oh, it just activated. Okay, cool. I thought it didn't activate for a second, because on in the system panel it said Windows is not activated. But, yeah, see, what what's up with this? It says Windows is not activated, but up here it says Windows is activated. Good job. <laughs> Typical. Anyway, um, so we'll probably do that here in a second. I need to go back. I need to configure the roles and features of the server. Because you, you should probably do this first before you install the Windows updates. So we want to do a role-based or feature-based installation on that hard drive. Okay, so what I want to do, I want to come down here to the file and storage services. So storage services are installed by default. But I want file server, and let's see, I think NFS allows us to use Unix-based computers, so I want that. So I can set up for Unix, yes, add the feature. Work folders, da 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 da, -da. probably don't need that. I don't think the system supports Hyper-V. Um, let's see, we want, um, Rapidly and remotely deploying Windows operating systems to computers over the network. I might toy with that. I might see if that actually works. I'm not sure. But I'll install it. Yes, add the features. Windows Server's Essentials Experience. What does that give us? Power functions PC, PC backups that help protect data. and Remote web access helps access business information from virtually anywhere. No. Windows Server Update Services allow network administrators to specify the Microsoft updates that should be installed, create separate groups of computers for different sets of updates, and get reports on the compliance levels of the computers and the updates that must be installed. Yes, because what I can do with this is if I, I can connect, I can actually connect Windows 10 Pro PCs to this domain that I could make, uh, which means I might have to set up some Actory, Active Directory stuff here. And I can connect computers to this, which would also allow me to, um, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought here because I just got a notification. Um, but in terms of uh, setting up computers, I can just set them up over this domain, log into the server, and as long as it's online, it won't like automatically shoehorn updates down the tube. I'd have to manually log into the server and allow the updates to be downloaded by those computers, which would actually come in handy. But anyway, I'll, I'll dink with that later if I ever find a need to have that. Um, .NET 3.5, yes, I want everything of .NET 4.6, although I don't think it's going to let me. I want everything of .NET 4.6, that way I don't have to install it later. 
Background Intelligent Transfer Service, yes, I want that because obviously it'll control how much goes out the network and doesn't saturate the network. Um, Windows Search Service, sure. Windows Server Backup, sure. Server Migration Tools, what's that? Oh, okay. That's if you're transferring from Windows Server 2012, which I'm not. SMB, because of course I'm going to use SMB because that's what the Mac will also work with. I don't need the SMTP server because that's for email. I'm not using this as an email server. That's something I do want to install is the quality Windows audio video experience. I do want that. Um, internet printing. I think that's if you plug a printer into this, you can then bridge it across the network. I think that's what that feature's for. You see, I remember setting up Windows Server 2012 at school. It actually does come in handy. Oh, yes, wireless LAN servers. I do need that. I can't believe I didn't select that. Obviously, you need the WoW 64 support because this is a 64-bit version of Windows that you're running. And I think... Branch cache, what's that? Still the service required to configure this computer. It's either hosted cache server or branch cache enabled. No, I don't need that. That's just going to use more RAM. All right, next. You know, deployment services. That's if you're using a PXE boot system. So, yes, I want both selected. Uh, SQL server connectivity, what the hell? Following features might be installed in the same. Oh, it can't use SQL and WID. Uh, I don't think I'll need SQL. Um, store updates in a following location. Can I just just not check that? Okay, good. Web server IIS role stuff like that. Probably just leave all the defaults set. Do you need to specify an alternate source path? A restart is required. The server restarts automatically without additional notifications. Yes. Um, okay, all that stuff. One or more installation selections are missing source files on the destination server. The server will try to get missing source files from Windows Update. Well, I can't because I don't have any kind of Ethernet stuff set up right at the moment. Support configuration settings. Well, isn't that just handy? <laughs> um, uh, can I just get it right from the USB stick? I have to call it D and sources. I don't think it'll let me do that, though. It's... All right, install. And there we go. Now we just sit back and let it do its thing. So we're just going to let that sit because that's going to take a long time to install. In the meantime, we'll go ahead and open up Task Manager and keep an eye on this stuff, which it does have the more modern Task Manager, just like Server 2012. And I actually think I'm going to go ahead and install the display driver so that way I can get full resolution. And that way it'll also help out when I'm over a remote desktop. It's not so dang laggy. Not like it makes that big of a difference, but, you know, thinking ahead. We're really doing good on the memory footprint. That's not bad at all. I'm impressed. Like, 35% memory? That's not bad at all. This is what I like about having these Windows Server operating systems is that they're actually fairly easy to configure with the graphical user interface. I'm not experienced with the non-GUI version, and you know maybe I might dink around with that, but really this GUI is very, very similar to that of... Um, no less than Windows Server 2008 R2, because that's the earliest one that I can remember setting stuff up on as a server. And literally, this is exactly the same setup process, and it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to configure. That's what I like about it. It's just so simple to configure. And that's what makes Windows Server really easy to work with. The only problem is, is trying to find an inexpensive license that's actually legitimate. So... That's the only problem. I think, if anything, you'd probably just get the server essentials, which would have all these features that I would need and no more, probably. So this is more along the lines, this version I'm running, excuse me, is along the lines of, um, for the big servers, like the big Xeon, the, the Skylake-based Xeon servers and stuff like that, the ones that run round the clock. Ooh, hello, we got an error. The request to add or remove features on the specified server failed. And of course, couldn't find the source. Go figure. 
Well, the one thing I'll actually go ahead and I'll add here real quick, if anything, um, update services. Okay, that might actually screw me over if I actually set that up, but I'm gonna just do it anyway. Remote access, I, did, I can't believe I just missed that. I need that remote desktop services. Volume activation services, ooh. <laughs> Means I could have a Windows product key that can stretch across multiple different things. Server for NFS, because obviously network file system, file server resource manager. And we're just gonna go ahead and set up the wireless LAN service. I think you can go into services.msc and you can actually set that up. Actually, cancel that. Let's actually go into services.msc and see if we can actually turn on that service. I don't know if it's actually in there by default. I'm not sure. I guess I'll find out here real quick. Save me from having to use that damn long thingy. Uh, do, 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 do. No, it's not. I thought it was. Xbox Live Game Save Xbox Live Authorization Manager. Whoa. Eh. But no, there is nothing in here for the uh, wireless networking service. So that's not fun. Um network settings. Is there even any kind of no uh, status so available networks? Does it even pick up the um, well that's the MAC address. It just shows the Ethernet controller, not the wireless card. I hate how they categorize everything. I have to go to the control panel to find that stuff. Network. I want to show my network devices. Network discoveries off, of course. Get out of here because it's not connected to a network. This button right here, change uh, change adapter settings. This is the one I was looking for. You can only get to it from the control panel, and clearly it has not installed the wireless card. So that makes sense. So I guess I will have to. We're just going to do that, and I just want to install the wireless LAN service. That's all I want to install is just the wireless LAN service. And then once I do that, it should pick up the Wi-Fi. It should pick up the Wi-Fi card I have installed, installed in this thing, and then I can get to installing all the rest of the services. And then it can then download anything it needs because it aired out trying to find the other sources, which it couldn't find because they don't exist because there's no networking. So, <laughs> yeah, that should hopefully fix that up. Maybe <laughs> takes it a while. At least it's not SQL Server, because again, SQL Server takes forever to do anything. Of course, we got to restart because it's a service installation, so we need to restart the server. So we'll do that now. Um, I need to take out the USB stick before I do. That way it doesn't try to boot up off of it. And I need to go to here. Yeah, see, there's no store, there's no edge, there's no nothing. Like, I can get the fact of pinning stuff there that actually would be useful, but there's just nothing there. And of course, Action Center, turn on Windows Smart Screen. Yes, we'll go ahead and turn that on. And then we need to restart the server. This is for a... Uh, da, 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 da. Operating system reconfiguration planned. Not like it makes a difference. <laughs> All right, there it goes, working on the update. Stopping the telemetry service. Ooh, <laughs> did you guys see that? <laughs> it mentioned telemetry in the services. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, that was actually a fairly quick reboot. Honestly, though, this is running as better than I expected. Although I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. It's Windows 10 based, and Windows 10 doesn't run half bad on a system like this, but... It does surprise me because Server 2016 is actually a very heavy operating system. And it's actually running surprisingly well on a little basic consumer grade dual core processor. And only DDR2 memory, so hey, I'll give Windows that. It actually does run well on older hardware, especially Windows 10. It actually does a pretty good job. Maybe someday it'll bring me up to the login prompt. <laughs> Yeah, these boot up times are worse than Windows 10, but there's a reason for it because it has a lot more services to boot up. 
like trusted installer because it has to work on the updates, which normally all these prompts about what it's doing are actually hidden by default. And if you know anything about the uh, those pirated versions of Windows, you'll know that they always by default always set those messages to run. And that's a good sign. That's a good sign, we got wireless. So that's good to see. Actually, I wonder, can we sign into the network right from the login screen? That would be useful. No, because there's no driver yet. Okay, fair enough. I'll have to get the USB Wi-Fi card driver. Not a big deal. Get that installed right away. Actually, we'll do that right now. Um, if it if Windows doesn't find it, I'll have this on a USB stick. Although, that's formatted as NTFS, so that's not going to let me write anything to it. So, we're going to use this 128 gig. Which I think is formatted as XFAT. I think it is. Uh, yes, yes, it is formatted as XFAT. Sweet. So I can literally just come into my documents folder and take this, drag it over, and Bob's your uncle. And there we go. Now I can eject the USB stick, and we're golden. Wait for it to eject, of course, because otherwise Mac OS gets really pissed off at you. Alright, there we go. And we'll take this and plug it in. And it detected it, and it's installing the driver. So, God, Windows Server is so easy to work on. It's so nice especially with the graphical user interface that's very familiar to that of Windows 10. It makes everything a breeze. All right, now we can go ahead and eject that USB stick because we don't need it anymore. And uh, we can go ahead and install the driver. The nice thing about Windows Server as well is that it's uh, not got UAC of any kind, so that makes it a breeze. You get smart screen but there is no uh, user account control on a server operating system, especially because I'm the administrator, so of course I don't have to worry about that. So now we gotta wait for the C++ redistributable to install. This wireless card actually works on, well, in theory, it's supposed to work on operating systems as low as Windows 98 first edition and work up to Windows 10. If I remember correctly, you get some stupid software utility but after that I think I need to set the default networking device to be the wireless adapter so I think if I go into network properties yep USB Wi-Fi card it's just disconnected sweet okay I might end up having to actually use that proprietary utility because I don't know if Windows actually will let you connect to that so let's see site survey refresh See if it'll pick it up here. Because this is not access, it's not being run as an access point, it's running as a regular old wireless adapter. Which is cool because you can actually run this as an access point. So if you want to bridge your current connection and just broadcast it out, that actually it, that does come in handy. But I don't think it's going to work because it's not detecting anything. So let's just see here. We need to go to dev mgmt.msc. And I believe Windows has the 802.11 USB Wi-Fi adapter driver built in. Oh, there it is, right there. So, um, oh, it's the 2015 driver. Okay, so that is the Windows driver. Okay, so I don't have to update it then. So, good old control panel to the rescue. We'll see if we can uh, get this connected to the internet. It's still defaulting to the dang ethernet. That's kind of annoying. Adapter settings. Can we get this to work? I want to set this as the default. So properties. Uh, da, 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 da. That's not what I'm looking for. I want status. Okay. So it's enabled. It apparently can run up to 600 megabits, which is interesting. So okay. Um. Actually, what we'll do, we'll just. For making this a lot easier, we'll just disable the Ethernet. And then connect, disconnect. Troubleshoot. What's going on here? 
don't tell me I'm going to have to actually connect this to an Ethernet based network and have to install everything that way. That would be super annoying. Good old network diagnostics. Uh, it's probably going to say that, oh, you need, to re you need to reboot your wireless router. I bet you if it says that, it's going to be hilarious, but yeah. Who knows, I might end up having to take this over to my grandma's house and I'll have to use her networking because at least I don't have to worry about it. Enable the wired network. Oh, it re-enabled it. Oh, you pesky thing. <laughs> I knew it was going to do that. There's nothing connected to the ethernet. There's nothing connected to it. Typical. Typical Windows. Yep. Ethernet adapter is disabled. I know that. Might be a problem with the driver for the Wi-Fi adapter. Ooh, that's a first. Then again, this Wi-Fi adapter is not supposed to be running anything newer than Windows 7, so oopsies. <laughs> yeah, we're getting into it now. Okay, let's see here. Uh, network adapters. Let's just go ahead and do driver, update driver, and we'll just do browse my computer. Let me pick. Um... Let's see what it thinks. Because the generic Windows wireless adapter stuff works just fine. So let me see. Is there a Microsoft category? Yes, Microsoft. Because I've never actually had bad luck with the Microsoft 802.11 G. Or was it G or was it N? That's a virtual adapter. That's not what I want. Where the heck is it? I know it's in here somewhere. It's like that generic 802.11 Wi-Fi driver that Microsoft uses by default. I don't think it's in here. These are all server drivers, so probably no surprise. Anyway, let's go back down to Raylink, because that's what this is. Uh, 802.11G USB 2.0 stick. Let's try that driver. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. The worst that's going to happen is it's just going to not work. Go back and, you know, reinstall something. If the connection's going bad, I'm sorry. My mom's watching Netflix, so it's not exactly helping out the computer. It's not helping out the network any right at the moment. So, yeah, sorry if the connection goes poor because she's watching Netflix. So, go figure. We do have a 25 meg connection, but it only acts like a 15 meg connection, and even then, we don't get the full 15 megs, in quote marks 25, that we're paying for, because CenturyLink is a Sentry scam, so. Granted, it is better than HughesNet, and if I had HughesNet still, which I don't want, but if I did have HughesNet still, then I wouldn't have to worry about all this networking mumbo jumbo, because I could just use the ethernet, but I can't, because of course that router is offline at the moment. And what I'd like to do is I need to run a sort of a, a WAN connection over to the other router. So that way I can use the other router as a range extender. So that way I can run Ethernet back in my room. But at the moment, that's not feasible because, of course, it's probably still got all the HughesNet junk on it. So who really knows? I do have, a, I do have some other Wi-Fi routers that I could probably just use as range extenders that will also allow me to use Ethernet. But I'm not going to bother setting those up today. Because networking isn't exactly my expertise, but I can figure some things out. It's just not my expertise. Oh, good, the connection's back to being normal, <laughs> somewhat normal, for like two for like two minutes, and then it's not going to work after that. Come on, it's all the driver already. God damn it! God, and I tell you what, the one thing about Windows that sucks is it takes forever to install drivers. For frig's sake, it's probably screwing up the wireless adapter as we speak. What are we doing? Now, now I can't even access the adapter settings window. Go figure! <laughs> uh, don't tell me. I'm going to have to go over to my grandmother's house. I'm going to have to connect this up to Ethernet that way. And then install all the, the services and the features and the updates and stuff like that. Eh, probably. The only sucky thing about that is I have to run it on her TV. And the TV's got the slowest reaction time. I'm not joking. When it receives a signal, it takes three seconds for it to display the image. It's the worst. 
Not all, not to not to mention it's uh, not a very good panel. I mean, it's a 1360 by 768 panel. No, 1366 by 768 panel, if I remember correctly. But it's the cheapest, most garbage display you'll ever look at. It's washed out. It's got terrible viewing angles, and uh, a three-second reaction time to when it receives a signal and then displays it on the panel it takes three seconds. Not joking. Then you got this TV, which displays it in an instant as soon as it displays. It gets a signal, it'll instantly display it. Even if it's not supported, it'll just display blank, but it'll at least display it. Okay, this is not working. Driver installation can't be canceled. Please wait while driver software is installed for your device. Canceling this wizard or turning off your computer before the installation is finished could cause your computer to become unstable. Ooh, scary. Pfft, I gotta reinstall, that's really not a big deal. I did nothing to this, so if I have to reinstall, who gives a crap? Who really gives a flying rat's ass, honestly? Well, while it's doing that, let's go ahead um, to go find, I think it's under, let's see, Windows System, I think it's under this PC, and I can right-click on that. Well, I thought I could. I thought I could do that from there, but I guess not. Whatever. Go to Personalize, and then uh, we'll need to put the this PC icon on the desktop, so you got to go to Themes and then Desktop Icon Settings. I like this a lot better than the way they're doing it now. Operation returned because the timeout period expired. Oh, well, of course. So, whatever. So we need to go to this PC and press manage. And then, oh, right, it's this. This is the manage, the server manager. I'm an idiot. Um, disks. And it should show that unpartitioned drive. Uh, yes, it does. I think. Does it? Because those are the card readers, so I don't want to worry about those. So that's the one. 31.5 gig. That's the boot partition. That's the recovery. Go to volumes overview. 266 gigs unallocated, which is what I want to do. So let's see. Nope, I don't want to query. Can I... Okay, new volume. We want to use the unpartitioned space on that drive. 266 gigs. Uh, we'll do 250. Play it safe. We'll sign it drive letter D. Uh... We're just going to call that storage. And of course, we're going to... Can we do that as uh, REFS? Ooh, interesting. Well, for now, we'll leave it as NTFS. And then create... Just watch this nuke the hard drive. <laughs> I'll laugh if it nukes the hard drive. <laughs> but no, it, it wouldn't because it knows that this is the boot partition, so it wouldn't actually nuke it. So 250 gig partition, it's probably gonna fail because Windows. Interesting that it had that partition called REFS. I've never actually used that before. I'm not sure if there's any difference between that and NTFS or if that's gonna be like some kind of new partition style that they're gonna be using in the future. Not quite sure about that. Because of course NTFS has been around since 1993, I think it was, that they first started using NTFS file partitions, or file system, sorry. So, not quite sure. Well, of course, it's slow as balls. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm probably going to go ahead and end the stream here because I'm not really doing anything. So, yeah. That was my fun with Windows Server 2016. So, maybe we might get this working again. I might figure something out. We'll see. Until then, guys, see you in the next one. And end.